Good morning, everyone. It's my distinct pleasure and privilege to introduce Dr. Barbara Danik as our grand round speaker today. Prior to coming to the University of Washington in 2020 and then starting her general cardiology fellowship training the following year, Barbara was an extremely prolific research fellow uh, working with Dr. Emmanuel Berlakis at UT Southwestern in Dallas. She then completed her internal medicine residency at Rutgers in New Jersey and now is about to finish her general cardiology fellowship. <laughs> We were uh, really excited and, and fortunate and thrilled that she decided to join our IC training program. Uh, she'll be starting in July. Um, she has already established a really impressive CV with over 50 publications in multiple important journals, including CERC cardiovascular interventions. And today she'll be speaking about a topic that I personally think is really exciting and a very uh, technically innovative space in IC, and that is uh, transcatheter applications of electrosurgery. Thanks, Barbara. All right, is my, is my mic working? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Chung, for that kind introduction. I am so excited to share with you a talk I prepared on a topic that I had to learn a lot about in order to give this talk, and that's applications of transcatheter electrosurgery. And I promise I'll explain what I mean in a moment. Let's see if these slides will advance. Okay, we're not advancing. Okay, there we are. All right, I have no disclosures. Okay, so in this talk, I'd like to take you with me on a journey into an emerging and at times surreal landscape of novel interventional techniques that are redefining what's possible. The objectives of my talk are to describe the technical aspects and feasibility of transcatheter electrosurgery and to discuss several applications, namely transeptal crossing, transcaval access, basilica, lampoon, sesame, the Seattle procedure, and mitroclip excision, and I promise I'll explain all of these in detail in a moment, and I'll outline some of the ongoing challenges in future directions here. In the interest of time, we'll focus primarily on techniques that relate to structural interventions, although it's worth noting that there are applications of electrosurgery in CTO-PCI and ACHD interventions. And similarly, one could consider uh, radiofrequency ablation of arrhythmias to be a form of transcatheter electrosurgery, although we won't cover that today. So the last two decades uh, have really opened um, amazing new therapeutic opportunities in structural heart disease, starting with TAVR in 2002, and then extending to transcatheter edge-to-edge uh, -edge repair, as well as transcatheter pulmonic prostheses, all with iterative improvements and expanded indications over the years. And in the course of these developments, several limitations have come up and posed new challenges uh, to proceduralists. Um, specifically the uh, need to cross tissue planes and, um, and obtain access in, in more challenging substrates. One area of particularly uh, uh, significant clinical need is the uh, mitral valve, which remains challenging to treat uh, transcatheter uh, in transcatheter ways, um, but is uh, really undergoing a lot of exciting uh, developments. Um, currently, transcatheter mitral valve replacement is performed using balloon expandable valves manufactured for the aortic position with anchoring in failed uh, surgical rings or valves um, or in severe mitral annular cal calcification. Dedicated transcatheter mitral prostheses, mostly in development, are shown at the bottom of this slide um, and are going to be an exciting new avenue here. So as I've alluded, structural interventional therapies for high-risk and inoperable patients have uncovered an emerging need, which is to cross tissue planes and uh, deliver catheters and devices across uh, those spaces, mimicking surgical techniques, but in a less invasive way. So how does this actually work? Well, the surgeons um, listening or in the room know that the application of monopolar radiofrequency current on an alternating on a, sorry, continuous basis, focally can achieve tissue cutting by vaporization of intracellular water molecules. That's the, uh, on the left side of this figure, that's the Bovi pencil, the yellow button achieves continuous uh, current application. That's in contrast to 
the coagulation mode, which is achieved by pressing the blue button on the Bovi pencil, again, familiar to surgeons, which delivers intermittent pulses of current, and that's primarily used to coagulate tissues. Transcatheter electrosurgery uh, involves traversal of tissue planes at a distance without direct visualization using conductive media, such as a guide wire. So this is what the current electrosurgical toolbox looks like. The uh, cutting element is a guide wire, which happens to be conductive and is uh, typically coated in a polymer coating that serves to facilitate guide wire delivery in uh, coronary interventions, but also happens to be an electrical insulator. And so it can be used to deliver current to a specific location to achieve tissue cutting. Um, guide wires are then further for this purpose, sheathed in plastic microcatheters and guides to improve insulation and maximize current density at the intended site. The active cutting site can be either the wire tip or um, a modification of the wire called the flying V, which is created by focally denuding the polymer coating on the uh, active side of the guide wire and then kinking the shaft with the back end of the scalpel so as to um, make it both visible on fluoroscopy and also to improve tissue contact at that site. That wire with the flying V element is then externalized and can be used to apply traction on both ends to improve tissue contact. Um, obviously a generator is necessary for this process as well. And at the time of cutting, non-ionic solutions such as contrast or uh, dextrose infusion is uh, infused alongside the active electrode site to uh, limit alternative current pathways within the bloodstream and reduce uh, the risk of thromboembolism. So we'll start by talking about two access problems. The first of these is relatively simple and is actually the, the broadest application of transcatheter electrosurgery, and that's transeptal crossing. Um, traditionally, transeptal access uh, was performed using a uh, Brock and Burrow needle by mechanical means, simply pushing the needle across the intratrial septum. Um, however, uh, in contemporary practice, there's a dedicated electrosurgical system that's been developed to do this by electrifying the tip of an 035 inch wire or a needle um, that has uh, conductive properties. And that allows crossing across the intratrial septum for the purpose of atrial fibrillation ablation, or left atrial appendage occlusion or transcatheter mitral interventions. Um, you can see on the right uh, hand panel here, the VersaCross system, which is uh, one such wire that has a pigtail configuration for safety. This is the only randomized trial I'll discuss today. And um, it uh, is a comparison of mechanical versus electrosurgically assisted transeptal crossing in 72 patients randomized one-to-one -one, with the primary outcome of uh, time to transeptal left atrial access, which was achieved uh, five minutes faster in the radar frequency uh, uh, assisted group, uh, two versus seven minutes. So really improves procedural efficiency. Failure to achieve crossing with the assigned uh, approach was 0% uh, in the radar frequency group versus 28% in the mechanical traditional needle group. Um, an interesting secondary outcome in this study was the um, appearance of uh, plastic dilator shavings on the needle introducer shown on the right hand of this uh, uh, figure. Um, that was seen in about a third of the patients with the traditional Brock and Burrow needle uh, and none of the patients um, with radio frequency left atrial access. There wasn't any significant difference in procedural complications, but there was an embolic stroke in the traditional needle group. Here's a more complex access problem, uh, and it has an electrosurgical solution. So this is a 77 year old woman with uh, a failed bioprosthetic surgical valve and very high surgical risk, but unfortunately has quite unfavorable femoral access for TAVR. Her alternatives are somewhat limited and uh, can be quite morbid. One access to consider in a case like this could be transapical access, but that carries uh, quite a bit of risk and is uh, essentially a surgical procedure. What about transaxillary access? That may not be favorable, favorable either. 
Um, in this particular case, there's a lot of tortuosity and small vessel diameters. And so the transcaval access approach was developed for situations like this. Um, this allows large bore aortic access using ephemeral venous entry point, followed by electrosurgical entry into the aorta at a predetermined favorable zone uh, within the infrarenal aorta. After wire access is obtained in the aorta, that's upsized to a stiffer wire and a sheath can be placed over that. Once that access point is no longer needed, the resulting AV fistula is closed with an null occluder. You might very reasonably ask if there's a lot of bleeding with this approach uh, when two non-compressible uh, vessels are punctured. Um, well, it turns out that the retroperitoneal pressure generally exceeds IVC pressure. And so um, the uh, lower pressure sink of the IVC actually accepts the blood flow that comes uh, from the aorta across the retro retroperitoneal space into the IVC. Um, there's, there may be some small amount of bleeding, but generally this addresses uh, any blood that would otherwise pool in the retroperitoneal space. This approach was studied for TAVR access in a multicenter cohort of 100 patients who had no favorable transfemoral access and were high surgical risk. Uh, an estimated 30-day uh, mortality of 10%. And as you can see here, this was uh, successful in 99% of patients facilitating TAVR. As you might expect, there was significant 30-day morbidity and mortality, um, but as I mentioned, this is a high-risk cohort. And importantly, this study was performed before the era of routine protamine reversal. And so you can see that there was a lot of bleeding in this group. Um, and it's also important to know that this was relatively early on in the experience with this approach. Uh, each center that had enrolled in this multi-center study had only performed a median of two transcable cases at that time. And so um, I think this uh, represents early experience. Uh, reassuringly, at one year follow-up, 86% of these patients had proven fistula occlusion by CT. Importantly, this technique and all of the techniques that I'll discuss today are technically complex and have a steep learning curve. And so it's important to interpret this data with that in mind. And really these procedures should be performed with, uh, ex by experienced operators or proctored by them. Okay. Um, so the next uh, area that I'll discuss is um, not an access problem, but is uh, a complication problem that we'll get into. So um, the risk of coronary obstruction during TAVR is real. Fortunately, it's pretty rare, uh, but it's something that um, should be considered beforehand and requires detailed review of the pre-procedural CT to assess risk. There are two major re reasons that a patient uh, could develop coronary obstruction after TAVR. Um, these are shown in panels A and B. Uh, in panel A, you see deficient or narrow sinuses, uh, just sort of uh, hugging the transcatheter valve. And in panel B, you see sinus sequestration, which involves sealing off of the sinuses uh, with the valve frame at the sinotubular junction. Fortunately, coronary obstruction occurs rarely during TAVR. It's estimated at less than 1% overall, but is more frequent in patients who are undergoing valve and valve TAVR, uh, particularly with externally mounted leaflets or stentless surgical prostheses. If coronary obstruction occurs, it's a pretty devastating complication with more than 50% 30-day mortality in some series. And importantly, bailout can be really challenging. There may not even be time for it, frankly, but um, snorkel stenting, which looks something like this, can be performed in some cases, although there are a lot of challenges with this approach as well. So obviously, uh, I'm going to talk about another uh, transcatheter technique that uh, addresses the risk of this complication. This is called basilica, and the idea is to lacerate the potentially offending uh, either native or prosthetic aortic leaflet beforehand, before the TAVR is placed, so as to allow displacement of the, um, the halves of that leaflet out of the way so that there's flow into the coronary ostium. Here's what that looks like. So as you can see um, in, in panel A on the right-hand side, uh, first a guide is positioned at the base of the potentially offending leaflet and a wire is 
uh, advanced through that guide and then electrified, allowing crossing of the base of that leaflet. That wire can then be snared in the left ventricular outflow tract and externalized, it has to be a long wire. And then a flying V cutting element can be positioned across the base of that leaflet. Um, and as current is applied, gentle traction allows laceration of the leaflet. And this allows the leaflet to splay to the sides, um, as you can see in panel uh, F here, uh, allowing flow into the coronary ostium. Here's what that looks like on fluoroscopy. In panel A, you can see um, uh, contrast injection into the left cusp where there's a um, uh, long leaflet that's indicated by a, a bidirectional arrow um, that would potentially cover the left coronary ostium. In panel B, there's guide wire traversal across the base of the leaflet and the wire is snared in the LVOT. And then in panel C, you can see a cutting element flying V with guides on either end and traction is being applied lacerating the leaflet and in panel D there's a patent uh, left coronary artery with a um, transcatheter valve in place. So this approach was studied initially in 30 patients who were uh, in need of TAVR due to severe or native biopersetic aortic stenosis but were high risk for coronary obstruction. Um, and in this cohort, high risk for coronary obstruction was defined as deficient sinuses, uh, so narrow sinuses, low coronary height, long leaflets, uh, or a uh, virtual valve to coronary distance of less than four millimeters, or they had risk of sinus sequestration with leaflets that reached the sinotubular junction or appealed to sear off, seal off the sinuses. Um, and as you can see in this group, technical success was quite high at 93%, and there was no coronary obstruction at 30 days. 30-day um, outcomes were favorable with respect to mortality of about, only about 3%, but there were quite a few strokes seen, um, which uh, was interesting and uh, perhaps unexpected. Um, it is important to note that these patients did not... Um, less than 50% of them had embolic protection used during the basilica. Um, and in a larger cohort uh, performed at uh, multiple centers, including over 200 patients, the stroke risk with this approach was uh, much lower in the range of 3%. So I think this represents early experience and it's unclear why exactly strokes were so frequent in this group. So who actually needs a basilica before TAVR? Well, in theory, the anatomic relationships between the aortic valve complex and the coronary ostia should inform the risk of coronary obstruction. Um, and so I figured as I was preparing this talk that I would just go to the literature, find a validated multivariable prediction model that would tell us who needs a basilica. But it turns out it's not that simple. That doesn't quite exist. Um, there are uh, attempts at defining variables that are associated with coronary obstruction, but um, it's challenging to study this because uh, it's fortunately a rare complication and patients who are felt to be high risk for coronary obstruction are often not offered TAVR for that reason. And so um, the data is a little bit sparse, but uh, some small registries, including 27 patients with native uh, um, native valves and then about 20 patients with prosthetic valves have been um, sort of evaluated to identify risk factors. Uh, historically, those have included a low left coronary height, less than 12 millimeters, or a um, relatively narrow left sinus, less than 30 millimeters. Uh, in valve and valve TAVR, a virtual valve to coronary distance of less than four millimeters has been associated with obstruction. This um, model that I'm showing on the slide is actually from uh, a, a newer uh, cohort that represents two pooled global registries um, with 60 patients that experienced um, coronary obstruction after TAVR, and they were propensity matched to um, an unrelated cohort that did not have coronary obstruction. And as you can see here, a few variables emerged as predictive of coronary obstruction. Those were cusp height greater than coronary height, which makes some sense. Um, and again, a valve to uh, coronary distance of less than four millimeters. And then the last variable that they found in this particular series was a culprit leaflet calcium volume above a certain threshold. So um, it's intriguing. I think this needs to be validated in order to be really useful, but 
but this is what um, we have so far. This is a related but um, separate technique that was really only uh, reported in a case, uh, but I found it an interesting, and so I wanted to just mention. Um, cathedral is a, an electrosurgical procedure that involves actually excising the aortic leaflet, um, and this was done in a patient who had a, a severe aortic insufficiency related to flail of, of a native leaflet. The way this was achieved was um, similar to basilica crossing the base of the leaflet, applying traction with a flying V cutting element, but instead of cutting with the flying V, um, a single loop snare was advanced over the base of the leaflet and the snare was electrified. So it, it's um, a novel technique that is certainly interesting, but is harder to apply broadly. So let's shift gears and talk about the mitral valve. Here's a patient who's 78 years old and had severe aortic stenosis, was treated surgically with a, a, a surgical bioprosthetic valve and two-vessel cabbage, and then ended up undergoing a valve and valve taver with a very small bioprosthesis and underwent a redo um, uh, surgical valve very recently, but also has severe calcific mitral stenosis that needs to be addressed. She has a lot of comorbidities, is very symptomatic, and is also frail. She has high surgical risk, in fact, extreme surgical risk for mitral valve replacement, and so is referred for consideration of valve and valve, excuse me, of uh, transcatheter mitral valve replacement with anchoring in mitral annular calcification. So as with TAVR, detailed pre-procedural CT analysis is really critical to successful TMVR. This figure illustrates um, a balloon expandable valve in the mitral position, uh, modeling the scenario that uh, such a valve would create in the left ventricular outflow tract. And I wanted to find a few key terms here that help us predict the risk of coronary obstruction, or of uh, LVOT obstruction. Um, so on the left-hand panels, you see a blue outline of the vibrosetic valve frame um, as it relates to the LVOT and the septum seen in cross-section on the bottom panels. And as you can see, there's just a sliver of space in the LVOT around the valve frame, uh, which is the defined as the predicted neo-LVOT area. It's really small in this particular case. Um, if you were to imagine what the um, space in the LVOT looks like with the open cell cells of the valve frame, um, uncovered, that would be the, just the skirt neo-LVOT, which is uh, shown on the right-hand side, and that's outlined by a red box. The atrial skirt of the prosthetic valve um, is, is the part that's included in that uh, measurement. And so when you look at it in cross-section in frame D, the resulting area is uh, somewhat larger. This um, aims to predict what the LVOT area would look like if there were not an, a long anterior mitral leaflet draping over those open cells of the valve frame. Uh, these dimensions are important because they influence the risk of LVOT obstruction, as I alluded. That's one of the major uh, limitations and uh, really the Achilles heel of transcatheter mitral valve replacement. Um, the relationships between the mitral annular plane and the aortic uh, plane, as well as leaflet morphology, septal, uh, basal septal anatomy, um, depth of the valve deployment, and uh, left ventricular cavity size all contribute to this phenomenon. Um, and for example, a long anterior mitral leaflet is felt to be a uh, particular risk factor for LVOT obstruction. In the early experience with TMBR, um, patients with long anterior mitral valve uh, leaflets were excluded from this procedure due to the concern for uh, LVOT obstruction. But there's clearly more to this risk than just the anterior mitral leaflet. Um, this is from a series of 194 patients who, were, um, who underwent TMBR with various anchoring in either valve and valve, valve and ring, or in MAC, um, and LVOT obstruction occurred in 13% of these patients. Um, the authors attempted to define which variables were associated with that risk, and what emerged is the neo-LVOT area as the strongest predictor of LVOT obstruction. But uh, another important variable was the mitral annulus distance to the septum. We know that LVOT obstruction 
during TMBR is a, a devastating complication. This represents the early experience at our center with TMBR, with anchoring in a ring or in, in MAC uh, in the years 2015 through 2020. As you can see, 40 patients underwent TMBR and 12.5% um, of them had LVOT obstruction. In those who developed LVOT obstruction, mortality was 60%. So it's really imperative to avoid this risk if at all possible. Various approaches have been um, conceived to uh, address this risk. And one of those is alcohol septal ablation. This has been studied in a few small series, um, mostly single center, uh, one of which is shown here uh, as a way to mitigate the risk of LVOT obstruction before TMBR. And this was compared to a group of patients undergoing alcohol septal ablation for HCM. Um, as I'm sure uh, many in the audience know, the idea of this approach is to instill a small amount of ethanol into a septal perforator to achieve uh, focused myocardial necrosis at the, um, uh, in the proximal septum where obstruction, obstruction is primarily felt to occur. Um, the challenge here is that really favorable septal anatomy is necessary. You need to have a septal perforator that goes to the precise location where the obstruction is occurring, and that's not always the case. Um, there's also initially edema in the myocardium that can actually worsen the situation, although later there can be remodeling. And really the, what this slide highlights is that there's a significant pacemaker risk with this approach. Um, in the patients in this cohort of uh, 22 patients undergoing um, this procedure prior to TMBR, the pacemaker rate was uh, 35%, which is really uh, significant. So the next transcatheter electrosurgical technique that I'll discuss is called Lampoon, and this aims to address some of the risk associated with TMBR and uh, outflow tract obstruction. Lampoon stands for laceration of the anterior mitral leaflet. And the way this is uh, done is by, um, similar to basilica, uh, crossing the base of the anterior mitral leaflet with a, an electrified wire, which is then snared in the left atrium or another cardiac chamber. Um, and then that wire is externalized and a, cutting v, a flying V cutting element is positioned across the leaflet. Once that is in place, uh, the wire is electrified, the, the cutting element uh, lacerates the leaflet with uh, gentle traction. And the idea is to do this sparing the cortical apparatus so that there's continued coaptation in systole. And as you can see on panel A, um, the leaflet splays to the side once the transcatheter valve is in place, allowing flow into the LVOT through the open uh, cells of the valve frame. Here's what that looks like on fluoroscopy. Um, and as traction is applied, the leaflet is lacerated and the catheters uh, disappear from the frame. Um, it's worth noting that this approach, and I'll just go back to the previous uh, picture, this is a retrograde approach through the aortic valve, which is not actually the way this procedure is done in contemporary practice. Uh, generally, this is done with transseptal access uh, into the left atrium in an antegrade fashion. There are a few um, other iterations of this approach that involve lacerating from the tip of the anterior mitral leaflet to the base if there is a pre-existing annuloplasty ring or failed surgical valve so, such that the annulus is protected. Here's what that looks like on 3D TEE. You can see the anterior mitral leaflet is lacerated at A2 and there's uh, relatively continued coaptation in systole. So this technique was studied initially in 30 patients who uh, were undergoing uh, TMVR, but were felt to have prohibitive risk due to a variety of risk factors for LVOT obstruction. Um, and so Lampoon was performed beforehand. Um, this is a group with high surgical risk, uh, estimated at 10% by STS. And what was shown was that this was feasible in 100% of patients without neurologic events which is reassuring given what we saw with Basilica. Um, and 30-day survival was relatively favorable as well. However, uh, 
Lampoon did not completely reduce the risk of LVO2 obstruction in all patients. And uh, really what emerged was that there are some patients who have um, narrowing in the LVOT and insufficient LVOT area that's not related to the anterior mitral leaflet, but rather to the septum, which is um, is really uh, obstructing that um, the outflow tract. So the lampoon failures are shown on this slide in, in red. Those were the ones with small um, neo-LVOTs and high gradients post TMBR. There were a couple patients who uh, were able to um, achieve partial tissue, uh, leaflet laceration, but this was not sufficient, um, probably because the leaflet wasn't crossed basally enough. Uh, these patients, the four that I've um, indicated here, the red and the orange and yellow, all required um, bailout alcohol septal ablation, which as we talked about is not always feasible or effective. So to address this issue, another procedure uh, has been developed and I'll spend a little bit of time talking about this. Uh, this is called sesame. It involves scoring the uh, septal myocardium uh, in the midline. And it's, it's really a revolutionary technique that essentially mimics a, a surgical myotomy with transcatheter means. The way this is done is by uh, advancing a, a stiff coronary guide wire into the basal anteroseptum. And that wire is navigated through the septum to a predetermined exit location back into the LV cavity. Um, once that wire is in the LV cavity, it can be snared, externalized, and a flying V cutting element can be positioned across the myocardium such that as that wire is electrified with current, a uh, laceration uh, is achieved. Here's another illustration of how that's, uh, how that's done. And I'll draw your attention to the image in the upper right-hand corner showing the laceration, which is uh, intended to be below the um, left-right commissure and extending towards the apex. Uh, this is relatively anterior, so as to avoid the membranous septum where the left bundle resides. Uh, this is obviously to mitigate the risk of conduction abnormalities related to the procedure. Here's what that looks like on porcine specimens um, at seven days and 30 days post procedurally. Um, on top, the seven day frames show that there's some loose fibrin uh, at the laceration site, which later becomes more fibrotic and the gross anatomic specimen uh, illustrates the laceration. As with all structural procedures, careful pre-procedural planning is essential to success. And here's what that looks like. In panel A, um, a uh, the projected sesame cut is illustrated in a faint green line. I don't know if you can see that, but um, this, the septal knuckle, if you will, is, is intended to be lacerated. And uh, the bottom two frames are, uh, are um, essentially projections that are reconstructed from the CT so as to aid operators as they uh, use biplane fluoroscopy to navigate through the myocardium in the intended trajectory. Um, the green line here on the bottom right hand shows uh, the projected cut of the sesame. Obviously these procedures rely heavily on excellent imaging both pre-procedurally but also intra-procedurally and so uh, transesophageal echocardiogram is also used to guide the wire trajectory. So the first um, it, real experience with sesame was just published a couple weeks ago. Um, and this included 76 patients at a single center in the years 2021 to 2023. Um, and this was a cohort with a few different groups, actually. The first was patients that are intended to go undergo transcatheter mitral valve replacement, but have a small predicted neo-LVOT with no gradient at baseline. Um, and then another group is also pre-TMBR, but actually have a significant LVOT gradient over 30, 30 millimeters. And then an additional cohort of HCM patients was included as well, also with symptomatic LVOT gradients. Um, for those who were intended to undergo TMBR, surgical risk was high at 9%. And most of these were elective procedures, although they did include a few patients who were urgent or emergent for various reasons. Uh, 
Um, te technical success of the procedure was 100%. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about those outcomes in a moment. Here's what it looked like on uh, fluoroscopy and TE. And I'll just draw your attention to the visualization of the wire in the myocardium um, in panels um, in panel F. You can appreciate that there's a uh, echo dense uh, element, which is the wire traversing the myocardium uh, in longitudinal cross section, and then in in short axis, you can see the wire as well. And what's important to know is that if the initial position of the wire is not quite right, it can be easily removed without particular consequences. And so um, this, this is an iterative process to find just the right location of the wire before laceration is performed. Here's what sesame looks like post-procedurally at uh, several intervals at um, and initially post-procedurally uh, and then 30, 30 days, six months, and 12 months. Uh, you can appreciate that initially the laceration is quite narrow and um, over time that splays to a wider angle, improving the LVOT area. In this cohort, patients who had gradients at baseline had significant reduction in those gradients, um, both at rest and with provocation. So what about the procedural complications? Uh, obviously important. Um, the overall survival at 30 days was 88% in this cohort. And as you can appreciate, those who underwent this procedural elective, procedure electively had uh, more favorable outcomes than those who underwent um, sesame in an urgent or emergent setting. The serious complications that were seen were ventricular free wall perforation, which occurred in three patients two of which were rapidly fatal. And those were patients that had relatively thin interventricular septa of less than 15 millimeters. There were also some VSDs in three patients which were generally small and restrictive. And pacemaker was required in four patients. It's important to mention also that VSDs occurred relatively early on in the experience when the intended myocardial laceration was a little bit deeper, uh, targeted at uh, two thirds of the septal thickness as operators gained more experience, they changed the target uh, laceration depth to 50% uh, of the myocardium. So what about sesame done at our center? Uh, we are um, one of few centers performing this procedure. Um, and at this time we have, uh, this procedure has been done in 35 patients and I'll report those outcomes here. Um, most of these patients underwent sesame to mitigate the risk of LVOT obstruction, although there were um, a few um, prior to TMVR, although there were a few that um, had HCM and one subaortic membrane that was lacerated. Um, these patients were uh, generally on the older side at 76 years. Most of them were women. They had a lot of comorbidities, including prior strokes, prior sur cardiac surgery. Um, over half of them had transcatheter valves, and their 30-day predicted mortality for MVR was quite high at 10%. Our early experience with this procedure suggests that there is uh, good procedural effectiveness in the sense that neo-LVOT gain is quite favorable. Uh, Two-thirds of patients achieve 75 millimeter squared improvement in their uh, predicted LVOT prior to TMVR, and in general, um, that has been uh, enough to facilitate TMBR. What this slide shows is a comparison of the first half of the, of the experience with this procedure at our center compared with the second half, demonstrating that there is a learning curve associated with this. And um, there was early hosp in hospital mortality in the first half of the group. Whereas in the second half of the group, uh, there was actually no in-hospital mortality in this cohort. Um, this was fortunately without any significant change in the achieved neo-LVOT. And so uh, what this illustrates is that as time has gone on, as more procedures have been done, it's become safer, but has remained effective. So let's come back to the patient that I introduced earlier. Her predicted neo-LVOT is really small at 15 millimeters squared. Uh, 
And she does have uh, a predicted skirt neal VOT that's a little bit more favorable at 200 millimeters squared with a maximal septal thickness of 28 millimeters. She's, for these reasons, felt to be at high risk for LVOT obstruction during TMBR, and so is referred for a sesame. That's shown here. Uh, you can see on TE the wire traversing myocardium uh, about one centimeter deep, which is um, the intended depth. Here's what her CT looked like after sesame. As you can see, she has a nice uh, laceration and trough in the LVOT, uh, which splays well and has enlarged her uh, predicted neo-LVOT post-TNVR to um, 154 millimeters squared. She is still symptomatic at this point and so uh, goes on to lampoon and TNVR. Here's what her lampoon looks like. You can appreciate on transesophageal echo catheters across uh, just abutting the base of the anterior mitral leaflet and then um, through the mitral valve orifice ready to snare uh, the wire as it traverses. And on fluoroscopy, the flying V cutting element seen in the center here achieves laceration of the anterior mitral leaflet. You can see that she has a balloon pump in place, which is used for most of these, uh, if not all. This is what the lampoon looks like uh, after a laceration. Her antromental leaflet is lacerated and there is a jet of regurgitation there, which is uh, the rationale for a balloon pump. She then goes on to a successful TNBR with a 29 millimeter sapien valve shown expanding here and um, her LVOT gradient is minimally increased from 10 to 13 millimeters mercury with uh, really dramatic improvement in her functional status. So we'll shift gears a little bit and talk about another uh, novel procedure that was actually developed here at our center. This is called the Seattle procedure and it involves um, removing atrial tumors such as myxomas using electrosurgery. Um, this is achieved with the setup shown here in the figure. Essentially, a three-loop snare is positioned adjacent to the mass of interest in the atria and grasps the mass, uh, shown in step one. Um, a uh, endovascular basket retrieval device is then advanced over the, over the mass. And then thirdly, a single-loop snare is advanced over that entire structure to the stock or base of the mass and once that's in place, the loop is electrified to achieve cutting of the stock. Uh, in this particular example, there's a relatively small mass that's removed shown at the bottom of this, uh, of this slide, but um, this has now been performed in several patients, including a patient with a three by two centimeter uh, myxoma. Lastly, we'll talk about one more patient who's looking for help, and this is an 84-year-old man who has a bicuspid aortic valve who has had a prior surgical AVR, uh, but also has severe mitral regurgitation, who was treated with an Alfieri stitch some years ago, um, and then later went on to MitraClip in 2017, but continues to have severe mitral regurgitation, and so um, in the context of class four symptoms and recurrent hospitalizations is traveling around the country looking for an answer to his predicament. Um, his surgical risk is felt to be too high to, um, to undergo mitral valve replacement. And so he's quite stuck. So the question is, can this be addressed electrosurgically? And as you might expect, the answer is yes. So this is what his valve looks like at baseline with an Alfieri stitch and a mitra clip that's uh, partly detached. And so he arrived here and was offered a um, mitra clip excision uh, as well as Alfieri stitch transection using um, electrosurgical techniques. And I'll show those here. Beforehand, he did have a CT to, to plan all of this and was felt to be at high risk for LVOT obstruction um, for TMVR, which he would ultimately need once the mitral clip is excised. And so was first, um, uh, first underwent a, a sesame shown here to improve the space in his uh, neo-LVOT beforehand. I won't show all of the procedural steps because it was a long one, but uh, ultimately the 
Alfieri stitch was lacerated with electrosurgery and uh, the clip was excised, shown here, uh, being removed using a basket retrieval device. And this is what the clip looked like. Following this, he underwent placement of a transcatheter mitral valve. This is an M3 trial valve that has a um, anchoring mechanism with several loops. Um, those are the spirals that you can't see my arrows. So those are the spirals uh, surrounding the valve frame. He did well. He did have some paravalvular leak that required plugging, but was ultimately discharged from the hospital without um, any residual mitral regurgitation. So I think these cases illustrate the potential of these techniques and are, are really exciting, especially for patients who have uh, no other good options. It's important to highlight that the structural team is more than just the interventionalist, obviously. Um, imaging is really essential to these procedures, both beforehand in terms of pre-procedural planning, but also obviously intra-procedurally. And to that end, our anesthesia team is really uh, critical. Um, they also obviously provide all of the anesthesia support that, um, that we need them to, to keep our patients stable throughout all of the uh, manipulations and uh, hemodynamic perturbations that they undergo. The surgical team is also essential to the success of these procedures. They always see these patients beforehand in clinic and help to define the best approach to their structural heart problems. Um, usually the surgical team is also uh, present interprocedurally for these cases. And then on the receiving end, the CCU is, is really key in terms of managing any complications that come up, um, which uh, is, is really critical to overall success for these patients. And then um, goes without saying, but I, I'll say it, the nurses and techs are also um, foundational to all of this work and they, they're so good that they often know what's going on before the fellow has figured it out. Um, and then at the center of all of this, the patient and their families are the ones who drive all of these efforts. Um, they often come so symptomatic that um, they're really desperate to have a solution to their problems. And so while they're counseled on all of the risks involved in these procedures, um, they often are very motivated to proceed. Uh, this is just to highlight um, some of the occupational risks that team members face during these complex procedures that are often several hours long. Uh, but we're fortunate to have a dedicated team that uh, is willing to go through all of this. So while there are obviously limitations to these techniques and there's a steep operator learning curve, um, and currently there's a lack of purpose-built devices to achieve these techniques, um, I think they really represent a dynamic landscape that's um, that has the potential to adapt to any unmet clinical needs that come up. Um, I think the key here is that these techniques are continuously evolving and they're not, um, you know, they, they haven't reached their final form, uh, but they're a tool that can be used in various scenarios. And I, I hope I've illustrated that. There are, are several really exciting uh, innovations on the horizon that are worth knowing about too. Um, there are now dedicated electrosurgical catheters and wires that are being developed and tested. Uh, one of these is, a, is called the telltale system, and that's um, to achieve basilica more, um, I think, in a more reproducible way. And we're, we're enrolling patients in that uh, trial here. Um, another exciting prospect is uh, modifying leaflets in other ways, not just lacerating them, but actually excising them, as I alluded earlier. There is a device on the horizon that will be able to excise leaflets, uh, uh, aortic leaflets prior to TAVR, and that's called Viking. And then, of course, dedicated transcatheter prostheses for the mitral valve specifically are uh, much anticipated, and those are all in trial currently, but um, hopefully in the next few years we'll, we'll have those commercially available. So in summary, um, Electrosurgical techniques facilitate and complement transcatheter therapies in patients who have limited options and limited therapeutic, um, uh, limited options. Um, and then multidisciplinary collaboration is really key to the su success of these procedures that are a dynamic landscape that are that's continually evolving. And so hopefully I've made this surreal landscape a little bit more familiar. 
And special thanks to Drs. McCabe, Chung, Elison, Steinberg, uh, Dr. Mackinson also for the imaging, and special thanks to Dr. Newton for her work in preparing this uh, registry of sesame patients. Thank you so much. That was an incredibly comprehensive overview of a really technically challenging landscape. Uh, just want to open it up to everybody in the room as well as online uh, for any comments or questions that you may have. Um, I'll get us started with one. Um, you know, at this point, as you are sort of anticipating the beginning of what I'm sure will be a long and very successful career in interventional. And as you're thinking about all the varied um, new skills, knowledge that you'll have to assimilate um, during what may seem like a long period of time, two years, but there's you know a lot to cover during that time. How do you think about uh, gaining exposure and then ultimately, you know, being able to master some of these really technically complex things that, you know, we're not doing every single day as a trainee? How do you um, sort of think about approaching that piece of things? Yeah, that's a, a very relevant question uh, that's sort of at the front of my mind. Um, so thanks for bringing that up. I, you know, I think being involved with um, looking at how patients undergoing these procedures are doing from the you know research clinical research standpoint is really helpful because it sort of forces me to look at how these procedures are actually described at least in the in the reports um, and so learning some of the techniques that way is has been helpful um, but obviously that's very much an approximation. And so um, really getting uh, into the room, if at all possible, to uh, scrub into these cases and um, see how things are actually done in, in, in practice is really um, essential. And I've been fortunate to have that opportunity on a few occasions. Um, but I think also just um, you know being aware of the literature that's emerging on these topics, although it's pretty sparse, um, is, is really key. But I think what's you know what's particularly interesting about these procedures is that they're not really fixed. They're constantly evolving. And so more than knowing the specific steps for a given procedure, it's important to know what, you know, what catheter can be used for what purpose and adapted to a particular scenario. And I find that when I, you know, when I do join the team for these cases, it's often uh, sort of an evolution, um, sometimes even in the course of the case. Um, just to uh, respond to new scenarios that were perhaps not predicted. Um, but, you know, I'm fortunate to work with people who are incredibly skilled, um, who know what's possible and kind of know the limitations as well. And so learning from them is, um, is incredible. I, I feel so lucky to be able to do that. Oh, okay. So um, we have an online question from uh, Dr. Nazar. We're going to unmute him and see if he can go ahead and ask that question himself. Oh, brother, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. First of all, Barbara, amazing talk. I'm sorry I'm stuck at home, but uh, I learned a lot. Um, uh, so two questions, one easy, one hard. And if you guys want to unmute Dr. Chris Patton, she might also want to opine. First one is, does the silica increase post taver AI or paravalvular leak. Um, and second one, uh, more challenging one, and Chris and I have been texting back and forth because we're both eagerly watching this, is what do you think about the regulatory pathway? You mentioned Telltale and Viking are making dedicated devices. Um, are these gonna be really long, painful PMA pathways? Uh, and then also, are, you, are there going to need to be custom generators? Or since they're quote unquote just wires, is it going to be sort of a class two or a 510K quick to market kind of thing? Uh, I acknowledge the second question is very uh, unfair to ask. But um, yeah, I love your thoughts and your team's thoughts. Yeah, I think everything is fair game. Um, yeah, to the first question, um, I don't believe that the silica uh, increases the risk of AI or paravalvular leak. I think. In fact, um, leaflets that are bulky and calcified are more likely to do, do that on their own. And if they're splayed out of the way, 
it doesn't particularly change that risk profile. Um, and I'm getting um, nods of approval from the structural folks in the room. Um, and then to the second question about the regulatory pathways for these new devices on the horizon, um, my understanding is that um, they will not require uh, sort of bench forward testing um, because they're using uh, existing electrosurgical generators um, that are simply being applied to new wires. Uh, but I don't know the details of that, frankly, and, and perhaps Dr. McCabe has uh, more insight on that process. Uh, we can we can maybe take that offline, Bob. But but um, but the what's I guess what I'll do is give a shout out to Robert Letterman, who's always been really fastidious about doing FDA approved IDE trials of these technologies. It's a lot of pushback that people are sort of being wild about this, but in fact. You know, if you you alluded to snorkel stenting, snorkel stenting has never been tested in any way, shape, or form in, in anything, right? But Basilica went through an IDE through the FDA. Um, what becomes challenging for this, and we've had a lot of FDA conversations, is what the test article is and whether or not they incorporate the valve as part of the test article um, relative to the to the manipulation of the leaflets beforehand. Um, so, for example, sesame. We tried to get an, an FDA IDE through. We actually had multiple FDA meetings about it, but they demanded that the TMVR and MAC also be part of the approval process because that has not doesn't have an FDA regulatory pathway. So it gets in the weeds and it's probably a very boring thing to talk about. But um, but anyway, there has been actually a lot of attention put on making sure that we've followed regulatory pathways, that we've got FDA approval. Um, and th these are done in IDEs, like they actually do have an adjudication committee for all of these technology techniques. So it's not simply just running about trying to slice anything you can find. Oh, that that's awesome. I think the testament to the structural field that you all chose to do IDE studies when you weren't forced to, I mean, these are off the shelf things. You could have just done all the cases, but I think the fact that you and your colleagues did IDE studies will probably accelerate it accelerate the regular regulatory path once the custom dedicated devices come through. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a very amazing field. Thank you, Barbara. I, I will ask another one that that was awesome talk. I feel like I got my head around it a little better now. So I appreciate that. Um, cause I, uh, um, the, you know, um, uh, democratization is a word that gets weaponized in this space a lot. It's like, well, how are you going to democratize this? And who, you know, is it just like ivory tower people versus all the rest of us or whatever? Um, tavers in 880 centers in the United States at this point, and the average number of tavers per center is not very high in the U.S. as opposed to other countries where it's a little more contained. Um, I guess as the feel things are getting easier they're getting more straightforward dedicated devices are coming um maybe just opine for a sec everyone can have a different opinion but um is are these should all these things happen everywhere um what's the how to how do you is should there be a regular like should there be who controls who gets what and um in terms of the new technologies when they come out and um, should we aim for everyone being able to do everything? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I think um, sort of um, inherent to the way that you asked the question, and, and certainly my view is that these procedures should not be performed everywhere. I think some of them perhaps, you know, perhaps Basilica is a skill set that's achievable with a device that's dedicated for that purpose. Um, but, you know, perhaps sesame is not a procedure that everybody should be doing because it really requires not just the interventionalist skills, but also the support of um, intraprocedural imaging that's not available everywhere. Um, and it just doesn't make sense for um, sort of the leading edge of uh, a field to be 
everywhere uh, possible. And so I think it's important to um, for operators doing structural procedures to recognize which patients are high risk. And to that end, it's you know critical that we uh, analyze existing data and you know collect more data to uh, determine which patients, for example, are at high, highest risk of coronary obstruction during TAVR. Um, which ones are the highest risk for TNDR. And um, in that sense, uh, sort of triage these procedures to folks who know how to deal with them should they arise. Obviously, some complications are unpredictable, and that's just the challenge of this field. But um, I think it's imperative that operators performing structural procedures sort of know their limits and know, you know what they shouldn't embark on and refer elsewhere if if needed as to whether that should be regulated in um sort of a more central way i think in this country it's unlikely that that's going to happen perhaps in um you know in european countries where things are a little bit more um, organized in some sense um that might be possible but i don't expect that to happen here Mm -hmm. I'll just amplify that a little bit and thoughts that I've had for a number of years, and that is you have interventional training. That's all about stents and coronaries and calcium and vessels and how to deal with all of that. In my humble opinion, I think this is entirely different. There are some skills potentially, I mean, guiding catheters, wires, but it has nothing to do with trying to figure out how to take care of a calcified LAD lesion. So I, I think we should be advocating, which would help some over a period of time, is that structural becomes a separate thing. It's not, it's not part of interventional, it's not part of coronary interventional training because it's so unique to what you're doing. And that would at least allow people to go through formal training, be certified in this, um, and not have to spend two, three years trying to get through this because it is very much different than someone who says I'm an interventional cardiologist so I, so I can do everything. So just a, a thought. You're saying like my outstanding colleague. Yeah. <laughs> we love you, Todd. So there's one other uh, live remote question. Dr. Thompson wanted to know about homolysis. So you're modifying these valves. Uh, the valves are designed very carefully to avoid hemolysis, and then you cut the leaflets or um, change the flow patterns. Is there any risk of hemolysis, or has this been looked at? Yeah, so just to clarify, um, the leaflet that's being modified is not the new valve uh, leaflet, but rather the, the failed leaflet of either, it depends what we're talking about, but um, if it's like a failed mitral prosthesis, then it's the the failed valve that's being lacerated. So just to clarify that, I hope I made that clear. Um, so the the new valve is not actually modified and it should really have the expected flow pattern. There is a risk of hemolysis related to paravalvular leak, which is not insignificant and often needs to be dealt with uh, by plugging. Mm -hmm. um, and that is one of the remaining challenges in this field, frankly. And I think that once there are dedicated mitral prostheses um, on the market, we'll hopefully see less of that, but it is something that um, can be a real problem for patients. So um, I didn't talk much about that at all, but it is certainly part of this space. All right, well, we're up at the end of the hour. Thank you so much, Dr. Danik, and for everyone that joined us both in person and online.